Welcome to the Indie Film NYC Podcast, where we help filmmakers merge the art and business of independent filmmaking. I'm your host, John Fallon. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Werner Herzog's Masterclass. I partnered up with Masterclass because I believe that this is a game changer and aligns perfectly with our mission here at Indie Film NYC. Many filmmakers are frustrated with waiting around for opportunities, and they are deciding to go out and shoot their own films on a micro budget. But there are many more who want to, but don't know where to start. And that's where Werner Herzog's Masterclass comes in. The class will give filmmakers a base of knowledge to finance, produce, and shoot projects on their own and start building a body of work now. I did a great write-up on the class on the five ways that Werner Herzog's Masterclass will help you achieve success as an indie filmmaker. So head on over to IndieFilmNYC.com forward slash masterclass to read all about it. And if you use the affiliate links on the page, you'll also be helping Indie Film NYC grow and bring you bigger and better resources. For episode number nine of the podcast, I had the opportunity to speak with Michael E. Bierman, a screenwriter from the Atlanta area. Michael is a multi-award winning screenwriter with over 30 awards in top tier international screenwriting contests. His script, Needles, was selected for both Top 10 Scripts for Science Fiction and Top 10 Scripts for Horror by Frank Darabont at the 2015 Austin Film Festival. Michael has had a few careers on his journey through life and is relatively new to screenwriting, having picked it up only three or four years ago. Because of this diverse background, he seemingly got a story for every occasion, and that ability to tell an engaging story comes through in his writing. He has that original voice that producers are always looking for. In speaking with Michael, he told me that he credits learning the craft of screenwriting to a lot of actual sitting down and writing, and three influential books. For formatting, he likes Your Cut To is Showing by T.J. Alex. For plot and structure, The 21st Century Screenplay by Linda Aronson. And finally, The Screenwriter's Bible by David Trottier for general information. If you're interested in learning more about these books, you can find links to them in the show notes. I'll let you listen to our conversation, and you can hear for yourselves the lessons in screenwriting and in life that he's learned along the way. Mike, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? My name is Mike Beerman. I'm a screenwriter and attorney. I live in uh, Kennesaw, which is a metro Atlanta area. Great. And uh, so that people can get a little bit of uh, background on uh, some of your work first, why don't you tell me a little bit about maybe some projects you've done, uh, and maybe uh, some projects that you're excited about that are coming up that you can actually talk about. Um, I've got, um, I have a number of co-written features uh, that I've written with other writers in, in various stages of development production, a um, couple of them being shopped at, <clears throat> at uh, WME and other places. I've written, co-written, or rewritten about 13 features. And uh, you told me you, you recently shot a project uh, for a for a forty eight hour film festival. Sure, that was a, a little seven minute short that uh, we got. We we're fortunate. My daughter Erica Bierman was in uh, the middle of Hunger Games films, playing Snow's granddaughter, and uh, also in Dumb and Dumber Two. Um, so we got her. Obviously, Hunger Games actors are good to have in your little short film. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had actors from Walking Dead. Fantastic Four Halloween, uh, Swamp Murders, American Pie, um, really nice professional cast of actors and a terrific crew. Um, wrote that, filmed it in a in a uh, cemetery in Kennesaw, and got uh, we took uh, a prize, a jury prize for best use of uh, character. So that was kind of fun. Right, so, and so that was a project that you wrote and also produced. Is that right? Yes, I co-wrote and co-produced it with a friend of mine named J.R. Wicker, who lives in Atlanta. Great. He actually invited me to come in, and uh, Tim Glover was the director, and he also co-produced. All right, so... Uh, I, I'm sorry, it's odd to have uh, three, three producers on such a small project, but we had about somewhere around 20, 25 people involved because there's so much to do in so little time. And, um, you know, we used a uh, $4,000 plus 4K drone, um, all kinds of high-end equipment. The whole thing was 1080p and 4K with high-def sound and a uh, uh, nice little story of, uh, you know, had higher meaning redemption. We drew science fiction. Um, and we did the whole thing for about 220 bucks. 
as much as feeding the crew chick fil <laughs> And so where did you get the, like, who donated the equipment? Well, Tim, that's where Tim got a co-producer credit uh, because he brought the, uh, he brought uh, camera equipment, lighting, and, uh, and the drone, the outstanding drone pilot as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, all that stuff's very expensive. So he wasn't involved in the nuts and bolts of getting the thing put together, but boy, he sure did do a terrific job, and he provided uh, most of the equipment. The sound guy had his own equipment, and some of the others did, but he, he largely provided it. And that goes to one of the, one of the topics I wanted to speak with you about, is when you're, when you're struggling to get your work out there, and maybe you have some features uh, being cast. I have one, it's a uh, CAA and Untitled Entertainment uh, Package Project being cast right now, and it's going, running along, and there are some others. Um, it gets really frustrating, so sometimes you have to kind of take the bull by the horns and do your own thing. And making shorts can be a nice calling card piece. You use your network of friends and uh, make a quality piece that everybody can be proud of, and that's what we did here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that uh, that's, a, that's a great lesson. I mean, you know, I, I think this theme will come up a couple times as we talk today, but, you know, having that network, developing those relationships is important for so many reasons. And it seems to me that, you know, screenwriters in particular, or aspiring screenwriters, I should say, in particular, they want to kind of sit in a room and, and, and create their art and then send it off into the world and, you know, kind of, that's their their piece of it. Like you said, if you're if you're having trouble getting that work out there, you've got to have a way to make that next step. Sure, and, and that raises a couple of um, topics I'd like to speak on briefly. Um, I'm a firm believer in content. Uh, I've been I've only been screenwriting for four years. I came to it very late. Uh, trial attorney, 15 years. Synthetic organic chemist for Dupont. I was in medical research sales for the world leader. Uh, I've had a number of, of different jobs, and I kind of fell into this because Erica was um, getting auditions, and my wife and I'd be getting her off book, and of course we'd be reading the sides and the scripts. Sides, for those who don't know, are small pieces of the script generally given for an audition. Um, sometimes they match the real project, sometimes they don't. Um, some of the stuff that I read was just appallingly bad. Some mm -hmm. of the auditions, uh, the, the material was just not good. And so I read these screenplays and I said, wow, you know, I, I, just, I just can't believe that this is the level that's going into production in Hollywood. I, I, I think I can do that. And so I bought uh, The Screenwriter's Bible by David uh, Trottier, and which is an outstanding general introductory reference to screenwriting I recommend, one of three books I recommend. Um, and I glanced through it, I didn't read the whole thing. I taught myself to screenwrite. My wife thought I was crazy. The um, first screenplay I wrote was a 20-page short. I entered it into Page, and it eventually took uh, top 25 scripts at Page Awards, which is arguably number two or three contest in the world with uh, most people consider the Nickel, the Academy contest, um, to be the top. And then, of course, there's Austin, which I'm very fond of. I, I had a great experience at Austin. And so I, I really like Austin, but I basically taught myself to screenwrite. Then I <clears throat> graduated to a feature, and my first feature has taken second, fourth, fourth, fifth, honorable mention in contests all over the world. So that's a little bit of a, uh, a, a kick in the pants for people to get motivated. Uh, you can learn the craft. You can teach yourself. You can do it through classes, you can do it through writing groups. I taught myself that just completely by myself, um, but you can do it. Um, in four years now, I've won 40 screenwriting awards in major contests all over the world. That's, that's incredible. So uh, let me ask you something though. What do you think allowed you that, that freedom? Like why didn't you have to take a class? What were you doing to, to facilitate your learning process? You know, in law school, you. You uh, mainly teach yourself, and I, I was used to that method where you teach yourself. I'm a pretty smart guy. That helped. And uh, I've written most of my life in some form or another poetry. I took uh, honors poetry at, at Penn State twice, uh, composition. I studied under some pretty famous poets. I placed out at the first couple Englishes and, and uh, took honors English a couple times. 
uh, poetry compositions. So I've written for a long time. But screenwriting is, is very, very different. It's, it's more akin to poetry than it is to uh, novelization, to novel writing. Um, I tend to write short, which lended, uh, it, it made the bridge easier for me to cross the screenwriting from other forms of writing where I have, whereas I have friends who are novelists and they have great difficulty because they can generate the kind of, of extreme length and, you know, 100,000 words or whatever it is they're writing, you know, 390 page novel, 100,000 words. Um, I think I would struggle greatly with that. I've actually never tried to write a novel. But going from the poetry into the poetics of screenwriting, which is a spare and sparse world, where you want to leave as much white space on the page as you can, and screenplays are often judged by appearance, white space, weight. They, you know, there are it's there are rumors, long-standing rumors of people in Hollywood who claim they've read so many screenplays they can hold your screenplay when presented to them and tell you if it's too long and hand it back just by the way. Mm -hmm. So appearance is a very important screenwriting. Uh, when you learn the craft, there are, there are numerous different styles you can learn. Uh, as to formatting, some people think that just having screenwriting software formats the screenplay for you and that's all you need. I've actually run into that several times. Nothing can be further from the truth. Formatting is an art and a science that has to be learned. It's very complex. The book that I recommend for that is a book by an anonymous writer out of Texas named T.J. Alex. And the book is called uh, Your Cut 2 is Showing. And it's absolutely uh, the best reference I've ever found. Uh, in my opinion, far better than the Hollywood Standard or, or even Trotter's book, anything else, for uh, formatting. And so you need to learn how to format because the, the first thing any experienced reader will do, despite you may have the best story anyone's ever read, if it's not presented in proper format, it will never be read. And so you need to learn formatting and you need to learn a consistent style of formatting and stick to that. Uh, there's a quote I like to say, and uh, I, I quote it often in my screenwriting group, but I say, Consistent, consistency pays unless you are consistently wrong. <laughs> and, and so I like to use that quote when someone is insistent on a point where they're, they're not right, mm -hmm. they're making a formatting error, they're making a, a, an objectively wrong decision, and you really need to learn to learn the craft, be consistent, apply it consistently, even if you're writing in different genres, uh, science fiction versus drama versus animated, it could all be very, very different, mm. but your, your basic craft needs to be consistent from one genre to the other. And that follows even if you're imitating someone else's writing voice. And the rewrite I did, um, I was rewriting for a a, it was a black crime drama with a black director, and the voice was very different in that, that type of genre and tone, and I had to mimic that voice. Even though I had to do that, I had to apply consistent screenwriting craft to the screenplay to uh, make it a quality screenplay anybody would want to read and produce. Formatting is it's definitely an underrated thing. It, it's something that is mystifying to a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> you know, like... Uh, they just want to know, you know, how do I write this particular type of slug line or, you know. Sure. I've heard that the Screenwriter's Bible is a great source to go to for specific questions on things like that. But I want to take a second. It's a good starting point. I prefer, um, I prefer the uh, Your Cut 2 is showing because it's far more exhaustive. Okay. And whereas the Trottier book is an outstanding overview of screenwriting in general and needs to be commended for writing the standard reference for introductory screenwriting. It, it's terrific. Um, your Cut to is showing is solely focused on formatting and it's much more exhaustive. Great. I'll, I'll definitely put that book in the show notes because I think that'll be helpful to a lot of the audience. Well, uh, let me give a shout out to another one then because I only recommend three books. Okay. We've talked about two of them. So before we move on, if you, if you like, I can, I can yeah. address the third book. There's a, uh, a writer out of Oxford uh, university called uh, Linda Aronson, and she wrote a book called The 21st Century Screenplay. This thing is absolute genius. 
it is the most comprehensive and in-depth guide to structured format and story theory I've ever seen. It's the only book on on uh, structure and plotting that I recommend. And she covers you know all the various numbers of acts of screenplays, the retrograde screenplays like uh, Memento, where the screenplay runs backward, which is interesting because the short that we referenced earlier, we talked about earlier, On My Way for the Atlanta 48 that won the award, I actually wrote that entire screenplay backward. In one point, because the ad, we had a sharp editor and he read and understood the screenplay, he actually, uh, we actually have part of the film running backward to make that time element very clear. Some of the characters move backward in action uh, in, in part of the scene taking us back to the opening, which is really the end. And then, of course, I, I added a, a bookend ending onto it because of uh, uh, storytelling to make it work really well. But uh, essentially, that whole screenplay is written backwards. And Harrington covers uh, endless uh, structures, fractured tandems uh, by the master, Guillermo Arriaga. I've spoken with him a couple times on Twitter, really nice guy. Uh, the Mexican uh, master of uh, the fractured tandem format. Uh, very, very complex. I actually wrote one of my screenplays based on that. I wrote a screenplay called Rust, which is a uh, <clears throat> it's a modified fractured tandem where you think you're in a poli police procedural, like a detective story, but you're actually stuck inside a horror movie. And uh, Three Burials of Belchiotti's Estrada, Babel, 21 Grants. Those are good examples of that style. Mm -hmm. uh, the Aronson book is phenomenal because it will allow you to look up the type of story that you want to tell, and it will allow you to go through uh, a beautifully organized volume and select the best form to tell that story. So you won't be struggling with form as much if you use that book and you understand it, because you can pick the form to pick to, to suit your story. And it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful book you can reference your entire life. It's like reading the Bible, I mean the Christian Bible. Mm -hmm. it's, ex it's extremely dense and complex, full of layers and wonderful. Didn't mean to do an ad for Linda here, but it's no, a great no. book. I, I think that that's a book I've never even, it's not been on my radar in any way, shape, or form. So. I'm excited to check it out myself. And it bears rereading. It's very dense and complex, and if you struggle with it, uh, don't blame me. Everybody does. Because <laughs> it, is a, it is a Herculean effort and absolutely wonderful book. With that, I mean, you, you touched on something that I, I want to talk about. Obviously, structure. You know, you've, you've got to you've got to uh, you've got to walk the walk, right? To <laughs> to have the screenplay. But when it comes to crafting, like the actual story, talk about the difference between, you know, making a good story and making a, you know, because it's one thing if you have, uh, I can write a, you know, probably a formattedly well screenplay about a guy walking to the grocery store buying some Oreos, but you know, nobody's gonna watch that movie. So uh, not, not necessarily <laughs> if you write it well enough, and you have, as you know. And I know you're giving me, a, you know, I'm playing, you're playing devil's advocate. If you, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you write it well enough, you can write a very compelling story with minimal locations. Uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a screenplay called Needles, which is an allegorical, diabolical thriller. Um, it's an update on the allegory of Christ's temptation by the, the devil in the, in the desert. It's an allegory of that and an updating of that. And I entered that into Austin uh, Film Festival, and Frank Darabont, director of Shawshank Redemption, creator of Walking Dead, a living legend, wonderful guy. Um, he actually picked Needle's top 10 scripts for science fiction and top 10 scripts for horror out of 8,627 odd scripts. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring up Needle's in this context is because Needle's, 97.5% of Needle's is one location. Hmm. Almost the entire script is is set in a western saloon. It's front and it's front porch. The uh, remaining couple elements are very very brief uh, flashback to ancient times. 
that comprises perhaps uh, a sixth of a page, and the remaining flashback is a rainy mountain road somewhere else out in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, other than that, the entire screenplay takes place in one place. Now, you mentioned the guy walking to the store to get some Oreos. Mm -hmm. uh, just as that seems like a very limited subject with not much going on, Needles is set entirely in a saloon with a limited number of characters. The, the, most of the action happens between two characters. And so obviously, when you're in that type of situation to tell a compelling story, you have to have very, very clever dialogue because it's gonna be dialogue handy if you're in a contained location. Contained screen plays, by the way, are very, very much in demand in Hollywood right now because you can bring the entire crew into one location, shoot the whole thing, get it done much faster without all the extra transportation expenses, plane tickets, moving, cast and crew, get in, get it done, and you have a, presumably with a great script, uh, a great story told very economically. Um, you need to concentrate on rising tension, um, reversals as the character, as the story progresses, and your character, it's kind of like uh, three steps forward, two steps back. Um, you're going to have reversals to keep the, the uh, audience involved, the tension rising. You're going to need to gradually increase the tension, um, hitting um, points where you're making major changes uh, in certain structural areas and moving into different acts or, or major reversals in the plot. And those are the things that keep the audience on the edge of their seat when you're telling a story about a guy walking two blocks from his house to get, you know, milk and Oreo. Mm -hmm. You build that deep characterization, so we care about that character. And you do it cleverly. You craft an ingenious screenplay that involves the audience. And, of course, the best screenplay is the audience forgets their reading, and they actually see it happen. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. The holy grail of screenwriting is for the writer the writer to so immerse the reader in the story that the reader forgets the reading. I'm not sure I answered your question, but there's something. No, oh, definitely. I, I mean, you can teach format, but can you teach creativity? You know? And that's, that's a great question. I believe that a certain amount of storytelling craft can be learned. However, I believe that that genius spark the absolute uh, fire of creativity that, that makes leaps and bounds and rise, that raises your screenplay up above the pedestrian screenplay that's out there on the market. Um, I don't think that can be taught. I think that, that is, that's why people gravitate toward writing and toward screenwriting because they are raconteurs. They have that storytelling gift and it's almost a curse. You have to write. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the craft can certainly be taught and it must be learned. Uh, that's the that's the uh, that's the key to the door because the door can't open if you can't write in, in proper format. If you if you don't have basic grammar, punctuation, formatting, and things of that nature down, no one's going to read more than a page of your screenplay. Uh, I've seen screenplays that were sent to me that I knew I would never even read at all because glancing at the first page. I could immediately tell, for example, it was overwritten, poorly formatted, poor grammar, etc. No matter how good the story is, I'm just not going to wait through that. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what readers and you know Hollywood is reputed to get a hundred thousand. I've heard the figure a number of times. I've seen pictures that purport to be rooms in major agencies with screenplays piled at the ceiling. Right. Um, they supposedly get a hundred thousand screenplays a year, and Hollywood. Now, Atlanta, of course, like the glass year, had one more film in Hollywood. Yeah, Atlanta. But um, uh, between the two of them, something like 200 films get made. Right. right. In, the, in the major systems. Of course, there are indies on top of that. And that brings us to another uh, topic after I finish this. But you've got to have the basic skills down, or no matter how great your story is, just no one's going to read it. They're going to pass on it. Uh, you can get vetted through contests if you perform well in contests consistently in the larger contests over you know, your genre or multiple genres uh, in different countries. Uh, eventually, you'll 
you'll garner some attention and hopefully get wrecked. And that's a great way to get your foot in the door uh, is to use contests. That's how I did it. Um, after that Austin, the attention I got in Austin, um, I ended up picking up a reputable manager. And so um, that's from my man cave, you know, my writing room uh-huh. in Kennesaw, Georgia, over my garage, not in Hollywood. So if you have the if you have the drive and the willingness to learn and the talent, you can do this. And more and more, it doesn't matter where you are for you to be able to do it. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. So part part of what you're saying is that to really know if your writing is, you know, quote unquote good, uh, is to get the validation from other sources. And, and one of your sources that you like is, is contests. Absolutely. Yeah, contests are a relatively inexpensive way uh, to get a reality check on your writing. Um, a lot of contests offer notes. I don't generally buy them. Uh, I do recommend in the beginning people take a take a chance and, and maybe buy um, notes from one or two contests. Blue Cat, run by uh, Gordy Hoffman, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's brother. Um, Gordy was an uh, award-winning uh, screenwriter uh, at Sundance. Uh, he wrote a, a fine screenplay that did very well there. Um, Gordy runs Blue Cat, and Blue Cat actually gives you a pretty in-depth set of notes uh, with your contest entry. So I think the contest, I haven't, I haven't entered Blue Cat. Uh, I think I entered once, I haven't entered again. Uh, it's something like 60, 65 bucks, I think. And with that, you get you know two or three pages of very detailed notes. Those notes can be absolutely invaluable to a beginning writer. Uh, your, your spouse, the person you, you sleep with is probably not going to be the best person to give you feedback, neither is your family, um, because most of them are too close to you and they're not writers. Um, contacts are a great way to get that kind of feedback. There are also script services like um, uh, Story Pros have been very kind to me, uh, I've done very well in their contests. I like Story Pros, Screen Craft. Uh, same thing. They run uh, very reputable uh, script services where you can buy certain levels of analysis and pay, you know, a hundred or or two hundred or five hundred dollars and get a an increasingly detailed and in-depth, professional and beautifully done analysis of your work. I want a uh, I want a deep analysis in a in a contest that came in second at uh, Story Pros Annual and uh, with a, a script called The Fad, which was actually my first uh, feature. And um, I used that on Rust, which I mentioned before as well. Mm-hmm. And I got, it was something like, it took them a couple months to do, but it was worth the wait because I got something like 12 pages of extremely in-depth analysis. When you get notes, you have to weigh the notes and decide what's for you and what isn't. It's your screenplay. And no one's going to be as close to it as you are. But when you look at notes, you you know you're going to read them, consider them, throw a lot of them out, and there are going to be some that are going to stick with you. If you get notes from multiple people, and the people are all saying the same thing uh, about a particular part or plot or character, and they think it's a problem, you probably have a problem. And so that's a good way to learn from others. And so script services can be very valuable. Um, you can also exchange reads with other screenwriters. I run a, uh, a screenwriting group, a closed group on uh, Facebook called Screenwriters who can actually write with over 2,000 members. One of my rules is, you know, you can exchange reads, but you damn well better give the notes you promise. Mm-hmm. Um, so if uh, I, I kick numerous people out for not uh, reciprocating the notes that they were given by another screenwriter, and I, I simply won't tolerate that. But if you exchange rates with other screenwriters, you read their screenplay and give them notes, and vice versa, um, you can get some really good insight, and you can learn very quickly. These uh, these script services, they really they don't have any vested interest other than the the fee they're collecting and and, and giving you the notes, right? There's there's because. And we won't get into it, but there are sites like uh, Inktip and, and, and Blacklist who, you know, I've, I've heard about them. They, they'll they give you notes with the promise of, uh, you know, exposure to industry. 
but you're talking about a completely different thing where where their only interest is, is basically you give me the money and I'm going to provide you this one service. Is that right? Correct. There's there's um, uh, without making any uh, allegation against the services you mentioned. Uh, there's no apparent or actual conflict of interest. Uh, it's simply a kind of like a pay to play. You give them the money and they analyze the screenplay. They're not going to come on as producers, which is a common thing. Um, reputable and some disreputable managers and agents will do. Um, you can you can have a manager who really likes your screenplay and agree to produce it as well, uh, which can in some cases lead to some conflicts of interest. But by and large, script service, you know, script sharks, another one. There are a bunch of them out there. They're individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't used a lot of them. I could, I could rattle off a couple dozen names uh, mm-hmm. of people I know that run script services. I occasionally do it, although I charge a fortune because I essentially do uh, a, a polish on the screenplay okay. uh, rather than just giving a page or two of notes. I'll actually. Uh, run through every single line of the screenplay and mark up the entire screenplay. Um, you know, write 10, 10 pages on, on structure and then we do a five hour phone call to talk about it all. Uh, not selling a service because I rarely do it, but right. you can find individuals, um, you can find individuals who will do that and depending on who they are and their credentials, those services can run and the depth of analysis you're looking for, those services go on anywhere from typically about 175 bucks all the way up to thousands of thousands of dollars. Uh, I charge I charge four figures when I do it, and and if I'm doing a, a polish or a rewrite, we're at the five. So, okay. uh, but you know there are lots of people that you can get for say 200, 300 bucks who can tear apart your screenplay and give you really good analysis that you can incorporate in the rewrite and take your screenplay to the next level. I used a, a writer on my first feature, The Fad, and I did that. Uh, it was already winning awards, but it went to the next level when uh, I employed a guy and used his services. He loved it, and gave me mostly very positive feedback, and actually told me he wanted to be longer. He <laughs> wanted more. Nice. And so I took the screenplay up from a probably flawed 87-page, two-short structure up to uh, eventually, I think it's 106 pages or, or so. And the guy charged me 125 bucks, and it was absolutely wonderful feedback. Wow, that's great. So just terrific. So I want to uh, kind of. So let's say we've 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 written our couple scripts, we've got our analysis, and now now we we want to make that step into uh, getting something produced. And in our pre-interview, uh, you you told me that you never query, you never send query letters. And so I think you know a lot of people they they don't like doing query letters for whatever reason. I mean I I haven't done them personally, so I have no opinion either way. I've heard they're, you know, a step to take that you can take. So for the people who are interested in going kind of your, uh, I'm going to call it a rogue method of, you know, an unusual method of not querying, how did you navigate those waters? How, how did you start getting work out uh, without doing queries? I, I wrote really good screenplays. Uh, that's the first thing. And, okay. You know, it sounds conceited to say that, but the, the contest proved the point. And again, that's why I like contests. Uh-huh. Um, your name comes off a screenplay in a contest, no one knows you from Adam. They have no idea who you are. And so that is consistent performance in contests is a true indicator of ability to write. You have people that have never met you, don't know what sex you are, don't know where you live in the world, don't know who you are, your level of education, um, skin color, nothing. They know nothing about you. And if you can consistently do well, in different countries. You know, I've, I've won awards in, in England. I, I wrote an Irish screenplay um, set in Northern Ireland that is um, completely written in, in Irish patterns of speech, uh, idiom and slang and Ulster Gaelic, a language I don't speak. And it took, uh, it, it finished very well. I think it was uh, uh, number four honorable mention, I'd have to look it up, at, in London. 
and I'm not Irish or I'm part Irish. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you write well, you can get that. It's almost like a credit card of credibility that, you know, you were eventually you get a reputation that your scripts are worth reading and, and the word gets out. You get requests to read and people read them. Um, I, I think <clears throat> eventually if you beat your head against the wall enough, you're going to want to self-produce and do something like that. And that comes back to the contained screenplay that I mentioned, which would be far less expensive to produce uh, by yourself or for yourself. Um, that when you can get the cost down, it makes things possible. I'm working on a, um, a screenplay with a friend of mine from Ohio, and she had completed a, oh, I helped her complete, I came in late, but I helped her complete a 33 minute short. And when I looked at the, at the story, I realized that there were a couple uh, opened and implied story arcs that weren't realized because of the, the short length. And so I approached her and I pitched her with uh, 12 scenes. I had very quickly just one or two lines jotted down so I wouldn't forget them. Mm -hmm. uh, how we could use all the footage that was already shot and finished, scored, professional composer, everything, beautiful little film. And we could go back in, call back only three of the actors, one of whom is her daughter, who's obviously going to be available. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the other two have already signed up to uh, do the feature. And we're going we're gonna to shoot the additional scenes, which are in different locations, and tell uh, related stories and theme, and that all tie back through several different uh, mechanisms I don't need to get into here, but they all tie back into the core story. We're going to shoot those uh, 12 or 13 scenes and cut them into the, the screenplay in appropriate places to raise the tension and for continuity so everything makes sense, put them in the right places, and we're going to make a feature, which we're then going to take to market. We will probably be able to make the entire film for under $5,000. For a feature, for 5000 Correct. And do, in doing that, you have to network, you have to call in favors, you have to, uh, you know, go to the actors you know, because you're not going to be making any money, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be getting paid uh, to make this thing. It's a labor of love, and, you know, it's the old copy and credit thing, but if you build a reputation, uh, you know, copy, credit, and food on the set, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's easy to make fun of, but if you build a reputation of, of doing quality work, writing well, uh, being a great grip or gaffer or director or producer, um, you know, whatever it is you do, if you get the reputation for doing quality work, you're going to attract quality people to you, and you can associate those people uh, in your film and uh, and make it for, for a lot less money than you would if you were, say, a jerk to everybody or you didn't know anybody. This is where all the networking we were discussing comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, you pull in those people, be nice, work with with everybody. Everyone's not going to get along, but you get through that, and uh, you can make a, a, a high quality product that way. So uh, that's one of the ways you can get around uh, not getting your foot in the door using the contest. If you're not ref, you can make calling card pieces. There was a guy named uh, Ilya something, I can't remember his last name, he's uh, Russian if I recall, who, he had a group, it's got a, it's got a bad name, do you care if I say it? No, go ahead. Uh, the, the, well, the name of the, the video is Bad Motherfucker. Okay. And this, uh, this guy made this, this absolutely remarkable short that went viral. Um, uh, his group, I think, is called uh, Biting Elbows or something like that. And this guy ended up, uh, I've watched it probably 50 times, it's an astonishing piece of work, and uh, he ended up getting read by a top five agent hmm. uh, based on uh, self-producing this, this uh, short film uh, that is very, uh, very stylish, very slick, very addictive watching it. You want to watch it again the minute it ends because you just say, I don't know how they even did this. And... He did this all himself on a very small budget, uh, did the music himself because he's a musician, mm -hmm. and he ended up getting picked up by, uh, uh, I want to say it was WME, but it's certainly one of the big ones. Wow.
so that's another another way to approach things. Um, a lot of a lot of writers in my group talk about query blasts, and there were two writers that did query blasts, as they they like to call them recently. Uh-huh. One of them sent out something. I think he sent something like six hundred queries, and essentially got no bites. Mm. Uh, it's a lot of work to even just changing the you know the the letterhead, the name and address, and all on a query who you're sending it to, and changing those emails. 600 is a lot of work. That's weeks and weeks of work. Sure. And so he was very disappointed. There's another writer that just found a, found a couple hundred, and he got 10 people asking to read a script. Producers, production companies, directors, actors, whomever he sent to. Mm-hmm. He's gotten 10 positive responses. Now, uh, I, I don't know if there's a take-home lesson there in terms of the numbers and you know, maybe one guy's better at querying or he's sure. better targeted his audience. I don't know. But there are people who query who like it and do very well. There's one writer uh, in the group who's an action writer. He writes, he writes uh, low-budget action. And I think he's getting his uh, fourth or sixth film made. Uh, and he has gotten, he's been repped in the past, he's gotten all of his uh, sales himself through querying. Wow. So... That's another very effective method that, that some writers um, some writers use. I guess I'm just lazy, and <laughs> I figured, you know, I figured if I racked up enough awards, I went, you know, 40 awards, I figured I'd get somebody's attention and eventually get on the radar. I didn't think it'd take 40, and it didn't quite take 40, but it took nearly 40. So, so I also wasn't, I wasn't, you know, putting out sending out notes to everybody in Hollywood saying I've done this or that and right. sending them a list of awards either. I was just sitting on them. So did um, you, was there a tipping point? Did people start calling you or emailing you? How did that work? Yeah, I got some, I got some high finishes in contests, uh, Austin, uh, Page Awards. I've taken top 25 scripts at Page um, maybe three times. I'd have to look it up two or three times. Um, when you get those kind of finishes, eventually you will get calls. People will come to you. I got a couple of script requests in, in the airport on the way to Austin because of press releases where people read about needles. So I actually was in the airport and I had uh, a manager and an agent, uh, or a manager and a producer, I can't remember what, um, one was definitely a manager. They actually called me and requested the script while I was sitting there waiting to fly to Austin. So they called, like on the phone, or they emailed? Yeah, they called, no, they, they called my cell phone. Nice. So, uh, which brings me to IMDb and IMDb Pro. Absolutely wonderful resources that everyone's serious about this, who's not a hobbyist, should get IMDb Pro. Uh, you get to put your pictures up of yourself, you can put pictures of your awards up. Um, I just helped a uh, multi-Emmy winner do her page. I've, I've got, you know, Connections, friends, I help out, and I constructed a page for a multi Emmy winner. And she had worked for over 20 years in the industry. She won two Emmys and been uh, nominated for two more on a massive, massive show. Uh, you would, everyone in the world would immediately know what the show was if I mentioned it. And uh, she had never done her page or, or gathered her awards together, and they were sprinkled over IMDb under a number of misspellings of her names, a little bit odd spelling. Uh, and so I went in and I combined four or five pages together and combined all our awards and her ranking, you know, the lower the number, the better, the worst rankings are seven and a half, eight million, six million. Uh, the lower you get, the better. Obviously, one is the best. Mm-hmm. And she fell from something like six million to 50,000 in one week because... I put her Emmy Award certificates up on her page, and I combined uh, almost 60 credits she had, including a couple iconic films, all into one page in one place, put up some pictures for her, and all of a sudden, boom, she landed a writing job uh, a week or two later. (laughs) Nice. I'm sorry, not a writing job. She's a writer, too. But she landed, I think it was an editing job, and she actually did get a query on one of her scripts, based on the attention that her page got. So IMDb, IMDb Pro is absolutely essential. It contains um, uh, all kinds of, you know, your your awards, although they don't let you put most of your awards up because the awards pages are semi-closed. Most awards you can't get up on IMDb, but some you can. 
Uh, I've got 40. I've got one win and six nominations showing. Uh, most of them you can't get up, but um, it'll show your, you know, your email, your phone number, whatever contact info you want, your companies that you have. One, I have two production companies, Minutes on Moving Pictures and Angry Cricket Productions. Uh, shows your manager if you're wrapped, how, how to get a hold of you professionally. And it lets you look at everyone else's companies and phone numbers and emails. And this is how these people are querying. Mm. They're querying off of, you know, the, there, there's a, a book you can buy that goes out of date for it fairly quickly uh, about, you know, everyone's screenwriting contacts in Hollywood and people buy it every year. I've never bought it. But um, other people go to IMDb Pro and they search genres for movies that are similar to what they've written and they target those producers and those directors, sometimes even the actors, to get them to read their scripts. And so IMDb Pro is absolutely wonderful for that. It's a necessity. Uh, I'm on it all day, every day. Two pro accounts, my daughter's and my own. I couldn't live without it. Um, endless amounts of information. What, what can uh, I do for you besides... Uh, I mean, obviously, people can contact you, and, and you can research them. And uh, you, well, know, you can vet people. Okay, I've, I've okay. worked on a couple projects where, uh, with other producers, where I, I found a, a guy that was a complete fraud. That's done this numerous times, but this guy had actually already signed onto the production and owned fifty percent of the film. And uh, I was able to do some research from IMDb Pro, branch out through some other things. Um, some secret stuff and I was able to find out that the guy was a complete con man uh, I'm an attorney when he was confronted he immediately surrendered his uh, entire interest in the, in the film so it's a good it's a good move if, if you're going to work with somebody that you don't know you know to help you it'll help you have one of those horror stories later in life right. <laughs> or, everyone that applies to my screenwriting group I vet every single person that applies. I research them. I see if I think they're professional, if they have the right interest, and if they're going to be a good fit for the group. And uh, IMDb, IMDb Pro is one of the first places I go for that. So this is part of the writer's toolbox. If you're writing a script, say a low-budget horror, you want to take it to uh, you know Blumhouse or or whoever it is that's doing that type of thing. Um, you can get all the contact info there. Uh, most places won't accept uh, unsolicited uh, queries and never send out a script unsolicited. Um, and, and always copyright everything. Uh, one of the primary rules I try to teach people. If you want to additionally register with WGA East or West and register your script, that's fine to do, but that doesn't protect your script. It doesn't get you into, into uh, federal court on a copyright action. So copyright is the go-to protection. Always copyright your script, use NDAs if you can get them. Most places won't sign NDAs, although they'll have you sign an NDA <laughs> really fast. Sure. They won't agree to sign them. Uh, don't want really to be a breaking point on a deal. But, you know, if you look at what happened on the uh, the Purge lawsuit with uh, uh, stole the Purge script, his original script, Settler's Day, if I recall, and uh, the fact that there was not a non-disclosure agreement used when the script uh, was pitched to them from his manager uh, actually shifted the outcome of the case. So wow. you do what you can to protect yourself and <clears throat> learn the craft, write the best script you can, enter contests, try and get try and get it out, try and get the work out there, uh, use script services to and other writers uh, to improve your craft, to get feedback. Um, be consistent, even if you're changing genres, write high quality material, and um, try to be nice to people. Try to make contacts and network. All of these things help for self-production. Another way to break in, as we've discussed, and um, you know, I think it's a marathon, not a sprint. That's, that's an old cliche, but it, it holds very true in screenwriting. Um, uh, you can't go out to Hollywood <clears throat> in your car. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Brad Pitt did that, okay? And, you you know, you can pick a number of actors that simply, you know, Brad leaves Missouri, gets in his beat-up car, drives to Hollywood, lives out of his car for a while, eventually becomes Brad Pitt, okay? Right. Uh, for every guy that does that, 
there are 10,000 that do it and don't make it. So, uh, you know, have a plan. The plan is, is usually, especially for screenwriting, going to be a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, initial success can be seen as flash in the pan. Uh, it's consistency and proving yourself over and over and over that'll get you writing jobs and that'll get you looked at as a go-to person. It's great when someone writes a first script that takes a my first script took off, but it didn't get me wrapped and I haven't sold it yet. <laughs> so, well, I think, uh, uh, yeah. I think your friend, you know, uh, I spoke with uh, Bob on a previous pub podcast, Bob Signs. Sure, he, Bob Signs, great, great guy, and great he, writer, really nice guy, great actor too. He had the same thing. His first script didn't go into production for eighteen years. Eighteen years. 18, so yeah, no. eighteen years. <laughs> I've been writing for four. So, you know, that, that that's a that's a wonderful point. Uh, 18 years, the stick and the toughness, the mental tenacity mm-hmm. to stay in there. And I, I know some stuff about Bob's projects I can't tell you, but I can tell you Bob is a busy guy. Mm-hmm. And it, it all came to him this year uh, where everything broke for him, and it, it's 18 years. There are other pro writers in the group that have been writing, another guy writing 18 years, and uh, they're starting to reap the rewards now. Uh, I would tell beginning screenwriters, you want to build up three to five scripts, high quality features, three to five, mix genres, whatever you want to do, that there's a difference of opinion of whether you have to write one genre or not. Sure. Build up three to five high quality scripts before you start querying and start looking for a manager. You can get those into contests as you go to build up some awards and recognition, but you've got to have a base of scripts because when you end up in that room and you're pitching a script in Hollywood or somewhere else, you can bet that somebody's going to say, well, that's all well and good. That sounds really nice. Uh, what else have you got? And the minute you don't have an answer for that, the meeting's over. I can hit him with 13. And I own, I half own one, a third of, I, own, I own a third of another, about 20% of another one, mm-hmm. half of another one. I can hit him with about 13 projects uh, that I'm involved with that I either wholly own or can help my friends out that I worked with, just worked with a, a best-selling Canadian author, James Costello, great guy, older guy, uh, best-selling author with HarperCollins, and uh, he'd written a novella of his into a uh, feature-length script. We made friends. I loved the idea, the theme of it. Uh, I agreed to read it on a possible rewrite. Um, three pages in, I called him up. I said, I love this thing. I want in. He said, you own half of it. Let's do it. And uh, we wrote it into a, a fine script called Jesus Came from Mississippi, which is being read by some very high-end people in Hollywood right now. And uh, we're now adapting that. Uh, the novella he wrote to the original screenplay to my page one rewrite is now getting adapted backward into a full-length novel by James that I'm co-writing. So yeah, it, it can be a strange process. It's another way to break in, right? A bestseller, Amazon self-published, Heath Harper Collins, which is, is great, but you can do it yourself. Get mm-hmm. a best-selling book on Amazon. That's where uh, Twilight came from. That's where Fifty Shades of Grey came from, fan fiction stuff. Uh, if you get enough followers, enough sales, you can uh, back into a film deal from your book. And the screenplay may exist first or not. So in our case with James, when the book hits the market, let's say it does well, Bryce book was a bestseller, uh, God bless him. If he does a great job and, and, and our book does well, uh, someone may come up to us with their hand out and say, great book, have you got a screenplay? And we'll, we'll immediately <laughs> say, uh, boy, have we got something for you. And so if somebody does ask you that question, what, what do you got, what else you got? Are you ready with the pitch? Like, can you give them the, 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 the elevator pitch? Uh, if I'm going into a room, I will study up and I will know, I will have log lines uh, at the very least. When I went to Austin, I had log lines and a five or eight line synopsis on every single one of my features. Folded up in a piece of paper in my pocket the whole trip. You know, right. I ran into Terry Rossi, a terrific guy. Uh, um, uh, ran into Shane Black. Talk with them, pictures them. You know, I showed my daughter a couple times. Uh, really liked her. Um, so uh, I ran into uh, uh, with John Lee Hancock, all kinds of people. And you just don't know who you're going to run into. So you've got to be ready if you're a professional. 
don't necessarily have to have everything memorized, but you've got to have at least a cheat sheet you can go to where you can run down some ideas. Uh, that's definitely uh, some good advice there. I mean, it just and seems... And cards printed up. Professionals have cards. So I'm an attorney. I have a card that mentions I'm an attorney, and I have screenwriting stuff all over it, too. So right. you don't need to write a novel on your card. It just needs that basic contact info. But, uh, you know, a card with a typewriter on one side uh, and your info on the back can get you, take you to great places, to get you a long way. Now this this is some really good information. That I want to wrap it up in a few minutes, but before we go, is there like a fun story, maybe uh, somebody you've met that gave you some good advice, or or maybe a fun experience that you've had, you know, that uh, not only you could relate as as a as a fun moment, but also a teaching moment. One of, one of the most profound experiences you'll have if you end up on a on a uh, ten pole movie set like Hunger Games or okay. Dumb and Dumber Two, and you get to sit and watch uh, actors work and. Uh, as I think Bob wrote an article in my group uh, yesterday, the day before Bob Saints, about uh, treating people well. Uh, you know, sit on that set and watch and see who treats people well and you know, who doesn't, and those are the kinds of folks you want to work with. What's awesome about it is that you have so much, so much information and experience that you that you can relate. You know, back to the back to the point of of being able to to write a quote unquote good screenplay. You know, if you don't get out and have experiences, if you don't, you know, meet these people, and you know, if you don't live a little bit, <laughs> right? And that's that's a great point. One of the one of my, you know, I'm an older guy. I, I had, you know, a trial attorney 15 years before I, I turned to this. And when Erica's career, Erica's career took off, and I started reading the scripts, and decided to become a screenwriter. Um, you know, that was a big change for me. Closed my law firm down, mostly. I still practice, but not much. I uh, take very few cases. Those are uh, big moments, and you, you've got to decide if you're going to commit, learn the craft, and, and, and make the change. Uh, beginning writers, uh, there are people at all levels. Some people are hobbyists that do this for fun and they never expect anything. Other people want to sell their scripts. Um, depending on what you want out of it, you've got to put the work in. It's a job. It's not, it's not fun. That, that rewrite I did, I worked uh, eight days, 16 hours a day, eight days in a row. Uh, when I thought I was going to get hired, three days before I got hired, I started the rewrite on the chance I'd get hired. Here's a story for you. Yeah, tell, tell me that story. Yeah, and I wrote, uh, I got down to two people from 19 writers on the project. Uh, I was down to the final two. Director liked me. I figured I'd get the job. You have to have a little confidence in this business, so I took a chance. I rolled the dice, and I started writing. 16 hours a day for three days. I got the call at night. Um almost midnight that uh, that I'd gotten the job and I told the director I got great news for you I'm three days into the rewrite and uh, I was given a month to do it uh, script had been uh, pitched to a major A-lister and they wanted it to wanted to get it going in a month and uh, I got it to them five days into the rewrite period so why is that important over deliver why, so why is that I, important you know in, in the world of screenwriting the world of basically being a professional what, why is that important, you know, if, if people aren't getting the, the point there? Uh, you know, it's, it's important because I, I knew they needed I knew they needed the screenplay fast, and I wanted I wanted to get it to them very quickly. I did the best job I could, and they loved it. And um, it was important to overperform when getting getting my foot in the door. It was very important to overperform on that first shot and do very well. And Returning kind of a, an excellent rewrite in five days is a hard thing to do, and they were impressed. Yeah, so, and, and I guess and that speaks to cultivating those relationships. Now they know that you're a guy they can count on. Uh, presumably, you know, it, it, with that uh, in development right now, and it's being uh, it's being cast. There, there's an A-lister which just cast a couple weeks ago. Uh, hopefully, it'll come back. I've got uh, LinkedIn recommendations and, and people that I can. That'll hopefully say I did a good job. Uh, there's not another writer after me, so it looks like I did the job. And uh, you know, being professional and delivering that high quality uh, script as quickly as you can is is a great place. It is a great place. It's a great place to be and a great thing to do. Well, I want to thank you for your time today. I mean, this is uh, you know, it's been kind of a masterclass in uh, you know getting your, getting in there and. Uh, you know, putting the gloves on and start swinging. 
So uh, I, I very much appreciate uh, being invited. I'm, I'm flattered and I'm honored, and uh, I hope that uh, some of this rambling will uh, help someone in some way. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. I got a ton of information about screenwriting from my talk with Michael E. Bierman, and I hope you did too. I've said it before, but I don't mind repeating that the script is the blueprint for your film. And if that film is not built on a solid foundation, then making your film will be that much harder. So it's in your interest to have the best screenplay possible before going into production. In my opinion, Michael gives some really great insight and advice on how to grow as an artist and screenwriter and put yourself out there. I honestly could have spoken with Michael for hours, and I doubt we would have found the bottom of his well of knowledge and experience. Being a filmmaker is a long journey, and success takes time, but if you always strive to do excellent work and prove that you're someone who can deliver quality work on time, then the people you're working with will not only want to work with you again, but they will recommend you to others who are looking for a solid collaborator. If you have any questions, comments, or insights that you'd like to share with Indie Film NYC, please reach out to us. You can do that by leaving a comment on any of the show pages, emailing me at john at IndieFilmNYC.com, or go to our contact page at IndieFilmNYC.com forward slash contact. The Indie Film NYC podcast is available on both iTunes and Stitcher. So if this podcast is interesting or useful to you, then please subscribe. And if you can give us a rating and review, that would be even better, because it will help more people find us and spread the word. And of course, please check out the other blog posts and filmmaking information that's available on our growing website, IndieFilmNYC.com. Thanks for listening.